Hi, Lisa. That was an amazing talk. She's from last week. And I will never think of the Christian cross in the same way again, because it makes so much sense that way. Question. I came from what might be called a narcissistic family. My body mind role was scapegoat. Try as I might, my family will not see anything else when they see me. I have learned about narcissist, narcissistic narcissism and know how to respond in ways that will keep me, my, me at least a little sane around them. But it is a thought consuming, but it is thought consuming and very hard work, and they are always 10 steps ahead of me. All that effort really just keeps me valuing and protecting and reinforcing this me. Is it enough to just be still and quiet around their counterproductive words and actions? Is it wise for me to keep allowing them to cut me down and present me constantly as deceitful and crazy when I expose serious abuse that was kept secret? I've been trying to be peaceful and quiet and just allow everything to happen, but I also wonder if that means I might be going along with lies again. I have never felt like calling them but they have contacted me again and all they want is their scapegoat back to get some more heat of themselves and they suffer a lot without me to play the role. They've gotten worse. I'm going back and forth in my mind. So do, no, sorry, mind. Do I tell them everything I see, I see no matter how crazy and imperceptive they will tell themselves I am? But at least I'll know I have held out the truth, or do I just go quiet and peaceful that they can they get bored to death and go away to find another more lively bear to dance in their circus? What would love do here? It's like I'm watching them walk into walls and into each other and into me and towards a cliff, and my voice isn't valued enough to wake them up even a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Denise. It's a beautiful question. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that, especially over the holiday period that we've just had with intense family stuff. So I'm not a qualified psychologist, as you know, so I really can't comment about this stuff. You know, like, what's the best action for you? Like, I know a lot about it, but it's, you know, I mean, maybe even a lot of psychologists don't know enough about it if you went to a psychologist, but I don't really know how to deal with a narcissistic family. It's really complicated. And you have to really go into details with somebody about how and what the best action is, is in that situation. And I'm really not suggesting to go quiet and, and, and allow them to abuse you. That sounds like seeking you know, in a way, but maybe in another way. But anyway, I can't comment on that. So that has to um, be something that you work out with somebody that really goes into depth with you or, or something you really thought about and studied or something you experiment with. But that would be irresponsible of me, irresponsible of me to tell you what to do, I think. However, how did you know there was going to be a but at the end of that? Pardon. However, I can speak about non-duality in regards to that. But that's not, when I seek out non-duality, I'm not telling you how to be with them. Because it might be the best thing to do is to cut them off. It might be the best thing to do is to really confront them. It might be the best thing to just spend short time with them. I don't know. In, in the behavioral science sense of the world. But from a non-dual perspective, there is no you that's being abused and there is no them that's abusing. And that's so far out there. It's so far out there. Please do not take that as a way to improve psychology or to improve your relationships, that will be disastrous. You'll end up getting abused more. But if you can go beyond the story, so in you, I suspect there is a child there that's seeking to resolve it. And I'm not saying don't try to resolve it, but the seeking is an identification with it. 
The seeking is a you that is trying to resolve it to become a more healthy you, but in a seeking way, not in a natural flow way, in a seeking way, because there is maybe, I don't know, fear of being abused, fear of pain, fear of being killed, not that they're going to kill you, but fear in the deep sense, like it's threatening your survival as a you. So there's all this seeking energy that's presented to in, in that situation. But that doesn't mean don't protect yourself from them. You know, often people hear that and they're like, oh, what she's saying is I need to take their abuse. No, no, that would more than likely be seeking. I'm not suggesting that. Certainly not. I'm not saying anything about what you should do behaviorally. Anything. But on the non-dual sense, there is nobody there either way. And the freedom, your absolute freedom, is coming to the I am or coming back to who you truly are. So that's the absolute freedom. And, and, and the recognition of the emptiness of it all, that it's absolutely empty. I just I just get nervous speaking like this, even though I really want to go for it, because I just feel like if people misinterpret this, they're going to end up in abusive situations. And that's the last thing I want. But I'm just going to really go for it, trusting that I've said it enough, you know, to stop that. Because they just really want to go for the non-duality in this, because freedom is in every situation, every situation, whether that's being raped, whether that's being abused, whether that's being in prison, whether that's being murdered, whether that's watching a loved one die, whether that's, you know, in the most horrifically traumatic experience and the most beautiful experience. So there's nothing which can keep you caged. You know, if you think about Nisigadatta Maharaj, you know, I'm sure he, he had a, a difficult external situation to some extent. Um, you know, he listened to his guru and his guru said to put the attention in the I am. So he did that for three years and then there was the shift. He trusted his guru, did it, and then there was a shift. But in that time, he also said, I had to work full time to, 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 to support my family. So he did that when he was working full time. And I can imagine that full time work for, with for him was not like full time work for us Westerners, which is like 40 hours. I know that some people work 60 hours because of, you know, these exceptions, but when I was in India, I used to, you know, wake up at like 7 a.m. and go for a walk. And the shop boys who had slept on their, not the shop boys, the stall holders who had slept, their stall was their bed because their family, you know, lived out in the countryside. So they would sleep where on top of the stall that they owned. And then they would wake up at 7 a.m. They would open the shop. And when I went to bed at night, they were still open selling things at like, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And then they would shut up, go to sleep on top of their bed, then wake up again and do it again. And then whatever they were selling, I'm sure they got such little money from. And I think that Nisigadatta Maharaj was in this line of work. Like he was a beady roller. So I can't imagine that he had financial security, that he had the ability to provide healthcare for his family, that he had peace and quiet. I'm sure that he lived in a super small apartment where they all slept most probably and ate and worked in one room. And then most probably lived on a busy road with lots of pollution. I don't know, I'm projecting, but just from knowing India and knowing Mumbai and the job of a beady role, a beady, beady maker, cigarette maker, um, you know, we romanticize that. Yeah, it maybe doesn't have the stress that we have in the West of having all these things. But just think about it, it has no health care. So him or any of his family get ill, 
they have to find the finances for it. They'd have to go and borrow money of someone so then they're indebted. Or, or the person would just have to be ill. It most probably meant that they'd witnessed family members dying in a lot of pain because they didn't have the money for the medicine. It's so easy for us to project onto people and romanticize people. You know, we hear Nisargadatta Maharaj's story, but I'm sure in his life, he had physical pain beyond what most of us know in the West. You know, the, the, if, if one of them have a nervous breakdown or can't do their work anymore, there's no government support for it. The family has to take control of it all. If one person, you know, if the family members gets addicted to substance, substances and becomes abusive, they're all living in an incredibly small apartment, most probably a one room studio apartment with a very abusive drug addict, if that happens. Can you begin to get a sense of the difficulties that could arise in their life? You know, a lot of us Westerners go to India and project all these romantic stories, but life there can be really tough. And, you know, and I remember in India, watching somebody die. You know, and I was only a tourist. I mean, I have been a tourist there a lot. But imagine if you lived there, the things that you would see, the cruelty of what happens to the animals on the streets, the dogs and the cats. And I, I just say this because Non-duality is not for the faint-hearted. It's really saying freedom in everything. So you don't need to get the perfect conditions, the perfect family to wake up. You don't need the silent retreat in the middle of the mountain. You don't need all these things. These things are nice and if the body can manage that, that's fantastic, but it's really freedom in everything. Freedom in living right on a busy street with honk, 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 honk. <laughs> not having any money in very difficult family situations. It's really, the freedom is the emptiness of all things, not what's happening in all things. And it's such a lie that you will wake up and then you will have this perfect karma where your family will be perfect, where you, you will only attract emotionally balanced people into your life. This is just not what's going to happen. I have so many people that project onto me that once I woke up, then I only project, I only attract liberated people that are super balanced and kind and nice and giving into my life. And if I have any negative person coming into my life, then there's surely something wrong with my energy. And that's fair enough for people to project that onto me. But it makes me realize this idea that we have of what enlightenment is. That is not enlightenment. Enlightenment to me is the coming home to what you are, which is emptiness of all things in every moment. It's not the appearances. It's not what's happening out there. The freedom is in here. Here. <laughs> which is everywhere. I hope that that's taken for what it is and it's not taken for allowing yourself to remain in abusive situations. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. I so appreciate it and I think lots of people will appreciate it. DL. Thank you.